Wow. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Shalom. Wow. <laughs> Shalom. Why we've got such a great combination. I see Americans. I see Brits. I see who else is here. Wow. All kinds. How about Canadians? Canadians. Wonderful. <laughs> Canadians, eh? A is right. Yeah, A. As soon as you have A, you know it's a Canadian. You know, you know why Canadians say A? It's the oh. way they spell Canada. C A N A D A. A. <laughs> Shalom from Sweden and Australia. Oh, good to see you again. Yes, you don't get sick of me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Faye. Good to see you. Shalom from Ireland. Oh, wonderful. Oh. Shalom from Prague. Oh, Prague. Wow, that's great. Well, you're closer to our time zone than anybody else. I think we're only an hour apart. Yes, I'm in Sweden. Yes. Great news coming out of Israel this week. Pardon? Great news coming out of Israel this week with Mike Pompeo's visit. Oh my goodness. What, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Baruch Hashem. Excellent. <laughs> I might do a drink in the kitchen, darling. Sandra, we have several uh, Bible students online this morning. Oh, um, that's great. We have Richard Doctor, Alice Snyder, Ken Osterman. Oh, and I see they're all using your name. Are they really? I see Paul and Joyce Lagno, Paul and Joyce Lagno, Paul and Joyce Lagno. <laughs> oh. But I know who the real Paul is. Change I'm sorry, your, I didn't see that. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, change your name, brethren. Yeah. I don't know. Paul. <laughs> That's okay, because I know who the real Paul is, so, you know. <laughs> That's funny. You can't fool me. There we go. There we okay. go. Yeah. Alice, you know how to change your name? <laughs> Brother Paul, this is me. No, I, I don't. <laughs> now. I put my name in English and Hebrew. Uh huh. Oh, I see Richard. Okay. There you go. You changed your name. Okay. Um, all right. Th today's meeting is actually the initiative for today's meeting was actually uh, Jennifer Neville, a very dear friend from the UK, uh, from Stoke on Trent. And uh, so she is going to be actually opening this meeting. Now I saw her and now I don't see her anymore. Are you there, Jennifer? Wait, here she is. I see her connecting. Okay, so we'll give Jennifer a bit of time to get back on. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge for some, I think, this uh, um, Zoom, but, it, but it's such an amazing uh, opportunity for us to talk and, and share, even if we're spread across so many different countries and continents. So that's really very, very special. Um, those of you who are connecting from North America, I know it's still fairly early in the morning, although those of you further east is not as bad, but Faye, you are really up early today. I don't hear you, Faye, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm unmuted now. Yeah, it's early. Is that, is that better now? <laughs> Hello? Yes, that, let's see. I see you, yes. Excellent. Yeah, can, can you hear me all right? We hear you great. 
Oh, that's great. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Okay, yes. Jennifer, I will turn it over to you to open the meeting. Yes, right. Oh, that's fine. Right. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Sandra with us, Sandra Ostabaras. Uh, she's extremely well placed to actually comment on the situation, particularly in Judea and Samaria. Uh, she comes with great experience and, and biblical insight into these issues, which are very, which is a very important topic. I've known Sandra over the years, and uh, we've had the pleasure of inviting her to some of our Israel Focus meetings in the West Midlands uh, in the UK. So it's a great pleasure to be able to connect with her this afternoon and to have this special presentation from her. And I'm sure you'll really be very blessed and encouraged and it will give you information, obviously, how to pray in this situation and to get a greater understanding of the issues at stake at the moment. So, uh, Sandra, I'd like to just hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I really, first of all, I wanna just thank you personally for reaching out to me and taking the initiative to have this meeting. And I know that you have personally invited and, and are responsible for a number of the people that are joining us today, in addition to some of our CFYC regulars. So welcome, old friends and new. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, just a couple of pointers and, and just to give you a sense of what we're doing. I'm going to be showing a short film, and then I'm going to be giving a talk, bringing you up to date based on the subject of this today's uh, meeting, From Abraham to the Abraham Accords. Um, and then we will have time for questions and answers. Uh, it's best if for now you keep yourselves muted, everyone should remain muted. Uh, and when we have questions and answers, uh, there's a very interesting feature in Zoom that most people don't know about that I only recently discovered. If you keep yourselves on mute but want to talk, if you just press the space bar on your computer, for those of you sitting in front of a computer, if you press the space bar on your computer, it will unmute you for as long as you have that space bar pressed. So if you do want to say something, press the space bar, say what you need to say, and then release it, and then it will automatically go back to muting. And that really helps a lot because very often people unmute themselves to say something, forget to mute themselves back, and then you hear all the conversation and noise in the background, which we don't need. Okay, so with that bit of introduction, let me now introduce this film. Um, we are going to, uh, it's a short film that we did a few months ago, just as this COVID corona season began. And it expresses, I think, uh, in a way that I think you'll find uh, moving, uh, both our, our you know, need to resort to media to stay in touch because we can't physically be together. And at the same time, I hope it will give you a little bit of a taste of Judea and Samaria, of biblical Israel, and the place that we will be talking about, which unfortunately you are not able to personally visit right now, but of course we hope that you will be able to visit very soon. So here is that film. We are experiencing a crisis of untold proportions. A simple virus has closed businesses and schools, churches and synagogues. Borders are closed and social distancing is the norm. But are we really distant? For more than two decades, CFOIC Heartland has been connecting Christians from all over the world with the land of Israel. We have bridged distances and created relationships that span cultures, countries, and faiths. You and I, Christian and Jew, have partnered together based on a common faith in the truth of God's word to the biblical forefathers and prophets, the promise of the land of Israel as an eternal possession of the Jewish people. Today, we can no longer visit with one another. The planes that once connected us have been grounded, but our relationship will withstand that. You have loved and supported us. You have declared our right to this land before the world 
and this is the land that you have helped to preserve and restore. These are the people that you have assisted and protected. This is the land that has connected us to one another. After centuries of exile and dispersion, the people of Israel have returned to the biblical heartland, our ancestral homeland, just as God promised. Even if your outcasts are at the ends of the world, from there the Lord your God will gather you. He will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. We have settled this land in fulfillment of prophecy, but we are also building a good and kind society where we reach out to our neighbors, care for them, and comfort them. My wife and I were both Holocaust survivors, and we were married for 69 years. She passed away three years ago I live alone. Losing a spouse is an earth-shattering experience for our seniors. Loneliness, depression, this is where we must step in. At the Seniors Club, they connect to people, they smile, they laugh, they come alive. A family in financial crisis is a family that cannot function. We help them find jobs and work with them to become better parents, but first, we have to make sure they have food. Okay guys, we have to pack 600 food packages for tonight so the family will have food for the holidays. And that's where CFOIC Heartland has made all the difference. We face so many levels of need. Teenagers at risk, children growing up in dysfunctional families, children with learning disabilities and ADD, and handicapped children. Early intervention is critical, but we're far from the urban centers where resources are plentiful. In Judea and Samaria, the community and the professionals work together, providing children with the care and the love they need. We enable these youngsters to become productive adults, contributing to Israel. I love it here. CFOIC has played a vital role in turning a dream of redemption into a reality. We are surrounded by hostile Arabs who attack us at every opportunity. The Israeli army has our backs, but they can't be everywhere at once. Volunteer rapid responders are filling in the gap, protecting the people of Judea and Samaria. What we need is cameras, drones, and communication devices. I have been attacked by terrorists. I've lost friends. Terrorists murdered two boys who were hiking in the valley below. But thanks to surveillance cameras donated by CFOIC, we will be able to stop the terror before it attacks us. Our Christian friends are literally saving lives. The restoration of our people and our land has brought ongoing challenges and risks. God has blessed our efforts, and so have you, our Christian friends. We are struggling to settle biblical Israel, to put down roots in our ancestral homeland. But you can partner with us as we nurture our children, embrace our elderly, and protect our families. Join us today and experience the fulfillment of prophecy. Together, we can weather any crisis and move forward towards restoration. Okay, that is uh, just to give you a sense of what we're doing at CFYC Heartland. But the theme, of course, of that film is really what we're all about. And that is the partnership between Christians and Jews. We are here settling the land and you Christians around the world who care, who want to know, 
you know, what it's all about and get involved and help in any way you can, that's really what we're doing here today. And the subject of our talk is just going to be one aspect of this. How is it that we can all work together to further the fulfillment of prophecy? And that really brings us to our subject today, from Abraham to the Abraham Accords. I, I want to start with Abraham, of course. Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham and tells him, go forward from your house, from your land, from your country, from your father's house, from the place of your birth to the land that I will show you. And he then makes promises to Abraham before he even gets to the land. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And through you will be blessed all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth. And Abraham, of course, obeys God, God's word and walks and walks and goes to the land of Canaan. But it is really only when he gets to the land of Canaan, when he gets to the Oak of Morah, that God stops him and says, this is where you're supposed to come to. And God says to him, I will give this land to your children. At which point, of course, Abraham built an altar to express his thanks to God who had appeared to him. Everything in the Bible from Genesis 12 on is about that promise to Abraham. The promise to Abraham, which is essentially two parts, a part of children or the children of Abraham that will be a unique nation, that nation that will then receive the land, the land of Israel. So in Genesis 12, we lay the foundation for the connection between the God of Israel the people of Israel, and the land of Israel. And if you go back through Jewish history, the history of the land of Israel, you will see that everything that has happened from Abraham's time to today is merely a playing out of that original game plan that God revealed to Abraham, that he continued to reveal in further detail uh, and further adaptations to Abraham's son Isaac making it very clear, it is Isaac that will be the heir to this promise, not Ishmael, to Jacob, making it clear that it is Jacob who will be the heir to the promise, not Esau, and then to all of Jacob's children who become the foundation of the nation of Israel, or Israel, of course, is Jacob's name, and the nation of Israel, when they first start out, are referred to as the children of Israel, literally the children of Jacob. Now, of course, later on in the Bible, uh, the nation of Israel is in the land of Israel. Uh, and we have this whole series of prophets, particularly the major prophets, that are uh, prophesying just before the destruction of the first temple and calling upon the nation to repent and return to God, because if they don't, they will be exiled for the, from the land and the temple will be destroyed. And that is exactly what happens. Um, but throughout this period, we have both the promises that are set forth in these prophecies and the original promises by God, both to Abraham, when he says to Abraham, this land will be an everlasting possession to the nation of Israel. And further on, later on in Deuteronomy, where God promises in Deuteronomy 30, after a period of exile, that God will gather us from all the nations to which we have been dispersed, and he will bring us back into the land of Israel. And we today are living in a very unique time because unlike you know, what was going on for almost 2000 years from the destruction of the second temple until today, today we are on an upward path. We see that the nation of Israel has been reborn in the land of Israel. The state of Israel was established in 1948. Uh, in 1967, um, Israel was forced to defend itself when Jordan, Syria, and Egypt attacked on all fronts. And um, as a result, Israel not only was able to repel the attack, but able, was able to liberate the area that we are focusing on today, Judea and Samaria, what is also referred to as the West Bank. And it is since 1967 that we have seen ourselves move forward, not just that we have a state, but we now have a state in much more defensible borders than we had before. But even more significantly, we now have a state located in Judea and Samaria as well, which is actually the heart of biblical Israel. 
if you pay attention to the places that are mentioned in the Bible, the places where God first made these promises to Abraham, the Oak of Morah, Shechem, we talk about Hebron, we talk about the mountains of Israel, all this is areas that were close to Israel before 1967, illegally occupied by Jordan, but today, since 1967, has been restored to Israel. Now, almost since the beginning, uh, actually immediately following the Six-Day War, I think actually the process began, you know, six days is a very short time to have a war, and it was amazing what a miraculous victory that was in such a short time. But from the beginning, I, even before the war was over, the nations of the world were not prepared to accept the legitimacy of Israel's presence in what they call the West Bank. And this, of course, created conflict, created um, a problem. Uh, and from the beginning, Israel was being pressured to withdraw from the area. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of what was going on in those few days and weeks following the Six Day War, but today when people talk about um, Israel withdrawing from Judea and Samaria, they refer to Resolution 242. And this resolution uh, was initially put on the table in the United Nations, requiring Israel to completely withdraw from every part of Judea and Samaria, including Jerusalem, the parts of Jerusalem that Israel liberated, which include the regular, the original biblical Jerusalem, the old city, and much more than just the old city. Uh, Israel, with the backing of the United States, ended up getting a different resolution passed. Instead of a resolution that required Israel to withdraw from all territories, the actual language of the resolution said that Israel would agree to withdraw from territories, which means that in order to fulfill its obligations under this resolution, it was enough that Israel withdraw from some territories. Well, Israel has already withdrawn from quite a number of territories. We withdrawed completely from the Sinai Peninsula, which was uh, liberated by Israel in that same war, uh, and was handed back to, to Egypt. We completely, we withdrew from a small part of the Golan Heights uh, that was captured at that point and handed that to Syria. So if, you, if people question, oh, you know, Israel still has obligations, we have no more obligations. We have fulfilled those obligations under international law. How, also, I may add that many people will say under international law, Israel has no right whatsoever to be in Judea and Samaria. That's completely not true, but I am not gonna go into the details of that because that would take up way too much time and that's not the focus of our talk today. What, what I just want to do in laying the foundation for the situation that we have is that the, since 1967, Israel has firm legal grounds to stand upon, both in its original entitlement or right to Judea and Samaria, also with regard to its fulfillment of its obligations under the UN resolutions that were passed uh, right after the Six Day War. Um, but if we go back to the original way or place where we started with Abraham, it is quite clear from a biblical, as well as from a historical point of view, this land has only ever been the land of the Jewish people. No other people has claimed this land as their own throughout history. And God himself made it very clear, I will give this land to your children. And God never changed his promise and this same theme was repeated by God and later by his prophets, making it very clear that the land belongs to Israel, that even after a period of exile, God will bring the people of Israel back into the land. That connection between the God of Israel, the land of Israel, and the people of Israel will never, ever be severed. Okay? Now, Unfortunately, then, we have a little bit of a, we have a problem here. What is the problem? On the one hand, you have an international community that has been overwhelmingly against a continued Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria. And on the other hand, we have Israel and we have our Jewish and Christian allies who understand Israel's biblical and historical and legal claim to this area. In fact, when the settlement movement first began, and it began 
all the way back in 1967, a little bit, you know, there were a couple of communities that were established right then and there. But the main focus of the settlement movement began after the Yom Kippur War in 1974. And the first community to be established in Samaria at that time was in, only in December of 1975. Most of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria today were established between 1975 and 1984. Okay, and this was at a time where basically the word the world uh, was against it, but they also didn't get that terribly involved in it. And frankly, I think that most countries did not take the settlement movement seriously. But our numbers continue to grow. Now, Menachem Begin, who was the Prime Minister of Israel in, from 1977, he actually brought a total shape, change in, in uh, policy on this issue for the good. One of the things that Menachem Begin always used to say, he would talk about facts on the ground. He would say, we in Israel, we Jews, we are going to, by changing reality, by doing things on the ground, we will create facts that will make our reality the real reality. And that is exactly the settlement movement. If you're going to take two things together, the settlement movement on the one hand is founded on a recognition that our return to biblical Israel, to the heartland of biblical Israel, is a fulfillment of prophecy. And if Ezekiel in chapter 36 talks about the mountains of Israel coming to life again, um, this is something that we see happening, but that requires our involvement. Because when God says the, the people will again return to the mountains, that means we've got to get up and go there. Okay, so the settlement movement is predicated on recognition that the time for the fulfillment of prophecy is now, but it requires our recognition and participation in that process. Okay, the second thing, though, talks about what political um, ramifications there will be by our actual actions. If we actually go and settle the land and develop communities, at some point, we become a reality that cannot be ignored. Now, for many, many decades, as our communities continue to grow, there remained international leaders that talked about expelling the Jews. They would talk about uprooting or dismantling the settlements. And I remember when I first moved here, first of all, I had taken all my life savings and mortgaged myself to be on my eyeballs, you know, to build my house, right? And here I am, I have a house and I have a family and when we moved into our house, we had three children, and then we had a fourth, and then we had a fifth. T today, thank God, you know, our children are married. We have grandchildren. Two families are back living in Carnation Road. Another family is living in Judea and Ephrat, and we have uh, another child in Jerusalem. Anyway, you don't need to hear my personal story. But the point is that when we first started out, and I'm building my house, and I put everything into it, and then for something to say they're going to dismantle me, I was thinking to myself, what do they think this is, Legoland? You know, just take apart something that's been built with people's hard work, with their savings. We built these communities to stay. And that's how we always saw them. That's how we've always um, uh, re responded, reacted to them. This is how we view them and nothing has changed. With numbers already comes though a certain changing reality, okay? And so more recent years, the conversation began to change. Uh, first of all, one of the criticisms that was leveled at the settlement movement, and, and to a certain degree, a legitimate criticism. There were all these people out there that were talking about two-state solution. And their vision was get rid of the Jews, redraw the line that was before the 67 war, the line that has the West Bank separate from the rest of Israel, turn that West Bank into something called Palestine. And that's the two-state solution. Now, of course, Israel opposed that for many different reasons, not least of which is the fact that having a, a, a Palestinian state, which certainly uh, will be run by a bunch of terrorists, I mean, because every, I mean, we know that since then, uh, the Oslo process, which began in 1993, as we began to transfer land to the Palestinian Authority in something that's less than a state, uh, what they did is they turned these areas that came un under their control into uh, bases for terrorism. So imagine having this entire area under the exclusive control of the Palestinian Authority 
with their guns and their missiles and whatever trained on us. This is an existential threat to Israel. So this is certainly not something that we would be in favor of. But also those of us who see things from a more prophetic, spiritual this point of view, this is not something we can voluntarily engage in. I mean, it could be something that will happen. Uh, we don't know, and sometimes God takes us back a step in order to bring us forward a few steps. But certainly, it's not the kind of process that we're going to condone. Because we believe that God, who has brought us back into this part of the land, does not want us to up and leave it. There's a certain responsibility that we have to the fulfillment of the prophetic process. And that's, that's where we are today. Okay? So we have this discord between the world that says leave and us who are saying stay. We belong here. It's legitimate. Now the sovereignty movement came actually, um, so, so basically what happened is we always said no to a two-state solution, but we didn't have a real plan other than to say it's ours. When people would ask specific questions like, what do you do with all the Arabs living there? And there's anywhere from two to three million Arabs living here in Judea and Samaria. What do you do with them? Do you give them citizenship? Are you going to have an autonomy? Are you going to have a relationship with Jordan? There are a lot of different questions, and the settlement movement never really had an answer. And one of the reasons we didn't have an answer was because nobody here wanted to create a situation where the Arabs would be given full citizenship. Given the, and the fear was that then they could end up voting us out of existence. So that, that's already been you know, a question. In more recent years, the sovereignty movement grew and what this was, and again, the sovereignty movement itself contains a number of different options. But what they all have in common is that Israel has to extend its sovereignty over at the very least parts of Judea and Samaria right away. Ultimately, all of Judea and Samaria. What to do with the Arabs? Well, that brings with it a lot of different options from autonomy, to, to a relationship with Jordan, to, you know, whatever, a number of different options. But whereas under Israeli law, the area that we call Judea and Samaria was never annexed. It was never considered an integral part of Israel from a legal point of view. Even though under international law, it was legitimate for Israel to extend its sovereignty, we never actually extended our sovereignty. We never applied is full Israeli law to the area so that me living here, I have the same laws applying to me that are applying to, to the rest of Israel. Right now, I am under, officially, under military law. Whereas my friend, neighbor, or relative who lives in Krasapa is under full Israeli law. And it's a, it, it sounds like it's a slight difference, but in practicality, it creates a lot of problems, not least of which have to do with our ability to expand our communities, which put us under great international pressure because we've never made that very solid um, affirmative statement, it's ours. And there's nothing like extending your sovereignty over the area to express that, that confidence. Yes, this is ours. So in recent years, a movement was underfoot to extend sovereignty and to move for, forward in this political thing. And actually, when people first started talking about it, even those of us who were in favor of it, we were extremely pessimistic that we would be able to change the way the rest of the world sees us. If you, for so many years, seeing country after country after country promoting a two-state solution and not giving uh, the state of Israel any option for holding on to Judea and Samaria, it's hard to imagine that one day there are actually people out there who would, who would recognize Israel's extending sovereignty all the, over the rest of, of, you know, of Israel, uh, over Judea and Samaria. Well, all that changed when President Trump was in office in the United States, when he came to power, we already had a very good feeling about his policies. He had made some very positive statements about Israel. We also, you know, he has uh, Jewish grandchildren. His daughter converted to Judaism. He is um, uh, his ambassador. The, the person that he, it was his personal lawyer, David Friedman. He chose to be uh, ambassador 
uh, United States ambassador to Israel. This is a man who for years was very, very involved in the community of Beit El, Bethel. Um, we knew who this guy was. We knew what his positions were. So when the American administration chooses a man like this to represent it in Israel as, as the ambassador, this already is sending a very loud and clear message where Trump and where the Trump administration stands on these issues. Now, a big move forward happened in uh, last uh, February or January when um, when President Trump announced his, uh, what became known as the Trump plan, uh, from peace to prosperity. And he actually, this plan was unveiled in two steps. The first step really had nothing to do with, uh, or didn't really have much to do with territory or even with the idea of a Palestinian state, yes or no. It was about economic uh, cooperation. And the linchpin of that was a conference that was held in Bahrain uh, and participants were mostly Arabs. Um, but it was opening the door for uh, co economic cooperation between the Arab world and Israel. Now, just to give you a bit of background, Israel, until this point, until just a few weeks ago, Israel had um, diplomatic relations, had signed peace treaties with Jordan and with Egypt. However, in both cases, it is what we would call a very cold peace. It is not like we're best friends. It is a real peace treaty. The treaty itself called for full normalization of relations, but that normalization never took place. And in fact, from the beginning, and Egypt's, uh, our peace treaty with Egypt goes way back to the late 70s, from the beginning, um, the Egyptian government was already sending messages to its own people. Yes, we signed a peace treaty with Israel, but don't believe it. Uh, Egyptian businesses were discouraged from doing business with Israel. Egyptian tourists were discouraged from visiting Israel. And even though at the very beginning, Israelis flocked to Egypt for, for touring where everybody wants to see the pyramids, that kind of slowed down as soon as we saw that it wasn't reciprocal, okay? And so on the one hand, we're grateful that we are not in a state of war with Egypt. It's not exactly the kind of peace that is doing that much for us. Uh, Jordan, there has been ongoing um, secret, undercover uh, relationships between the two countries, mostly having to do with combating mutual threats, terrorism, etc. But Jordan also has been unwilling to have full normalization and has been unwilling to, in any public way, put forward a warm relationship with Israel. Okay? Well, this summit that was held. Uh, almost a year ago, uh, between, uh, in the Gulf states, in Bahrain, set a whole different tone. And what we saw recently with the signing of what the, became known as the Abraham Accords, the agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, this unleashed a whole different atmosphere because it became very clear that it's, in, in, in many ways, I would say it is the Gulf states that are more eager for the relationship with Israel than we are eager with the relationship with them. Although there's a lot of excitement in Israel about this relationship, but the Gulf states are looking for economic opportunity. These people are businessmen. That's how they think. That's how they act. They have developed their countries. Uh, now Bahrain has also come into this and Netanyahu was just at a, secret meeting in Saudi Arabia, although everybody knows about it, so it can't exactly be called secret anymore. Uh, so there's no question there's a lot going on in the Gulf states. And there's two elements to that. One is economic, because as I said, these people are businessmen, and especially uh, Saudi Arabia is more conservative in its business interests, but Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, I mean, look at, um, if any of you see some of the ads that uh, are from Abu Dhabi and, and um, um, Dubai, you know, the kind of uh, United Arab Emirates uh, airlines, the kind of ads that are on CNN, for example, uh, advertising, they're, sh they're really turning to the Western world. They want investment. They want tourism. They're, and, and they're, from what I understand, they are a very comfortable place to do business for people. Um, they're different from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is still a very, very conservative country, although even so, 
a year ago, they opened their doors to tourists for the first time. Okay, anybody could come and, and visit uh, Saudi Arabia. Until then, they were a very conservative uh, country that didn't want anybody in the country that wasn't going to be, you know, Muslim with the four, full gear and the whole deal. That has changed. And that's only about a year ago. So that's part of what's going on here. And another part of what's going on here, probably even more significant when it comes to the agreement with Israel, that is Iran. Iran, first of all, is a radical Muslim country that is Shiite. So even as the Gulf states, with exception of Qatar, they're in a different category. They're one of the greatest sponsors of terror today. But these other countries, they have realized that if they stop supporting terrorism, business will be better. And that is what's better for them. Also, they've seen that it can, it can um, boomerang. If they support terrorism, then what's happened is we have the terrorists in, in Yemen, for example, that are attacking them. That, that they themselves can also become targets of terrorism, so they realize it's really not such a good idea to support terrorism. Um, that's number one. Number two, there's an ancient rift between the Shiite and Sunni Muslims. The Gulf states are Sunni, and Iran is Shiite, and they see Iran as the single most, the single most, the largest threat to their peace and stability, having nothing to do with Israel, okay? Iran, of course, is a global threat. They're the largest state supporter of terrorism. They export terrorism. Our problems at our northern border, uh, Syria and Lebanon, are all sponsored by Iran. Iran is also cozying up to Turkey, which is becoming a greater threat as well. This not only threatens Israel, it threatens the Gulf states as well, because there's enormous, enormous tension between Iran and those Sunni states. Obama. Now, we can say that for as long as Israel's been a state, as long since the Six Day War, every American government has been pro Israel, and every American government has been anti Judea and Samaria, categorically, every single one. Um, and and there's, there's been among them presidents who really and truly love Israel deeply and who have increased the military aid and in the earlier years, the economic aid to Israel and were truly leading a very pro-Israel policy. None of them supported the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, not a one. Um, and then came Obama, okay? Obama took, not only didn't support um, not only didn't Obama support Judea and Samaria, it was like everybody else, okay? But he was the first president who really and truly deepened the rift, turned these few areas of, of, of uh, disagreement between Israel and the United States into a real gap. And it was not just about Judea and Samaria. In fact, he took his... his um, amazing opposition to Judea and Samaria. Uh, he took that up to, to such a, an extreme that just days before he left office, knowing that instead of Clinton, his ally, taking over and continuing his policies, Donald Trump was going to take over and probably reverse his policies. So in a last minute grab, he engineered behind the scenes the Security Council resolution that effectively, uh, um, that effectively stated that the communities in Judea and Samaria are illegal under international law, something that had never been an official U.S. policy. And in fact, in, in the early years, in the, in the 80s and the 90s, the official policy of, of uh, the United States was that they were not illegal that they were not recommended, but they were not illegal. And then Obama switched that policy and not only switched it with regard to America, but switched that policy in the international arena by passing this resolution, which in fact has the potential to affect the legality of the way our communities are viewed under international law. But one of the things that was most um, difficult about Trump, excuse me, about Obama, was his attitude towards Iran. And he pushed and succeeded 
in signing an agreement with Iran, which re released billions of dollars to Iran that had been frozen assets that have been frozen in the United States because of Iran's pro-terrorism policy. It released those funds to Iran so that they were in a far better shape to continue supporting terrorism. Instead of stopping the nuclear program, it put certain holds on the nuclear program, but opened the door for Iranian um, uh, you know, bypass of the treaty, enabling them to be ready to deploy nuclear weapons and just not deploy them. Which means that at any point, Iran would decide to breach the agreement. It would take them about 10 minutes before it would be able to launch nuclear war against Israel, against any other nation it would decide to attack. Iran being a very unreliable and unstable and a terribly evil government, okay? This is not something we could tolerate. But it wasn't just Israel that is very afraid and very concerned about Iran. The Gulf states are as well. So it was the Obama presidency that laid the foundation in many ways for these Abraham courts. Because at that point, it was the Gulf states that looked around and said, okay, America has abandoned us. Now, Obama presented himself as the, um, the first American president to honor and respect Islam and to reach out. He made, he made his first visit to the Mid Middle East to Cairo. And when he was in Cairo, he made a speech that talked about extending our hands in peace and in honor and respect of our Muslim brothers. So Obama saw himself as the person who was going to create peace in the Middle East because he, the president of the United States, loves the Muslims. And yet what actually happened was the Gulf states looked at Obama and how he was treating Iran and said, this guy is not our friend. And in a way, ironically, that opened the door for cooperation between Israel and the Gulf states. Because the Gulf states looked around and said, the only country that stood up to fight against this Iran agreement was Israel. The only way we are going to be able to stand up against Iran is if we find a way to join with Israel. Now, through, for, throughout most of the Obama presidency and the first these last few years under Trump, uh, there was secret um, relationships going on between some of the Gulf states and Israel on this issue of protecting against Iran. Okay, but it was that series of relationships that enabled the Abraham Accords to be signed. Now, just before the Abraham Accords were, were signed, which was just a few weeks ago, we had that amazing from um, uh, Peace to Prosperity uh, and Trump's announcement in, in January, February, that he would be willing to recognize Israel's application of sovereignty to up to 30% of Judea and Samaria. Now at the time, there was tremendous excitement at this on behalf of the sovereignty movement, even as there were some people here in Judea and Samaria that were very against this because they were concerned. If he said up to 30%, does that mean we cut off the option of ever extending sovereignty to the other 70%? I don't agree. I think you start a process like that with small steps and nowhere in that plan does it say anything about restricting Israel's future ability to extend sovereignty. Not only that, whereas the plan did set up a potential for a Palestinian state, it redefined a Palestinian state so that it was really much less than a state, much more resembling an autonomy. And it also set conditions for the establishment of a state, conditions where Israel had effective veto power and there were conditions which if the Palestinians were ever to accept those conditions, then they essentially wouldn't be the Palestinians that we know today, but they would have undergone a tremendous metamorphosis. So either you can say it'll never happen, or you can say if it does happen, it doesn't have the same issues for us as it had the, with the Palestinians as we know them today. And when I talk about Palestinians, by the way, I'm not talking about individual Palestinians. I'm talking about their leadership, their political hierarchy, the people who actually make the difference and make the decisions, okay? One of the things that, that I am most frustrated about, if I look back over the past year, that between this statement, right after the statement, Bibi said, Netanyahu said, I'm coming back to Israel and we are right away gonna start annexing 
you know, applying sovereignty to this 30%. We're going to draw the maps. We're going to have it ready. We're starting next week. And with a, within a few days, we already had statements coming out from the White House saying, wait, wait, wait. We can't do this right away. We have to have a committee. We have to sit. We have to go over maps. And it is not clear to me today whether this was more the fault of the Americans, more the fault of the Israelis, or both. That we did not have a plan in place to extend sovereignty by July 1st, which was what Bibi promised. It's also what Bibi had written in to his coalition agreement with Gantz, that he could present sovereignty to the government, to the cabinet, to the Knesset on July 1st. And we knew there was no question we had enough votes in the Knesset and in the government to pass it. And yet July 1st came and went, nothing. Now there are those people who said, it's a good thing it didn't uh, get brought to the government because that gives us time to work on a better plan. But unfortunately, what happened was, is that Trump has in all likelihood, it hasn't been officially announced, but this is certainly what it looks like, Trump has in all likelihood lost the election. And our next president of the United States is going to be Biden, Joe Biden, okay? Joe Biden was vice president under Obama. Joe Biden's initial appointments, just the, the people that we have been reading about in the newspapers over the last few days, he is turning to the policy advisors that were either his policy advisors when he was in the Obama administration or Obama's policy advisors. He has already made statements saying that he is going back to this two-state solution paradigm, a paradigm that has been proven just a, a total, a total, uh, a total failure, okay? So if indeed Biden becomes president on January 20th, and we will know this on January 20th, okay? This is not something that's gonna last forever, this uncertainty. Uh, if Biden indeed becomes president on January 20th, we anticipate a shift, a total shift in the, um, in the, attitude of the American administration to the issue of settlements and to the issue of Judea and Samaria. Uh, while Biden is indeed, he calls himself a Zionist, he calls himself a true friend of Israel, um, there, there, there is, I think most people feel that everything having to do with uh, security assistance and cooperation with Israel on the broader level, there is a sense that that will continue Although, because this has always been Biden's, um, Biden's uh, policy, his, his opinions, political views have always been pro-Israel when it comes to standing with Israel as a military ally uh, and providing the military cooperation that is very, very important to Israel. Unfortunately, there are two issues. First of all, since Obama, since Biden was prime minister, the Democratic Party has shifted far more to the left. And if we look at the Democratic primaries, even though in the end Biden won, um, Sanders, Bernie Sanders, garnered a tremendous amount of support within the, the um, Democratic Party. And those people are still very influential in the Democratic Party. So now there is a growing group of people within the Democratic Party that are not just anti-settlements, they are anti-Israel. They are, you know, if it were up to them, uh, America withdraw uh, its, its uh, military support uh, of Israel. And that indeed would, of course, be very, very threatening. Another thing that's a very big, a great concern to us with regard to Biden is the fact that he has, he has made it very clear that one of the first things he wants to do is reopen the, the uh, agreement with, with, uh, with Iran. And that, of course, is not only making Israel very, very nervous, um, it is making the Gulf states very nervous. And this is where um, we are seeing uh, something that may put a positive wrench in this whole picture, okay? When Obama got up and talked about changing American policy, he was basically saying, America has never shown the proper respect and sought proper friendships with the Muslim world. 
Arab world, Muslim world, whatever. And when he did that, he was talking about the whole Muslim world, from Indonesia to the Gulf states, to Iran, to everybody, okay? And in much of what he said and did, by the way, he was kind of like um, a bull in a china shop, okay? There are huge differences between these various Muslim countries to the extent that Iran, that the Gulf states will rather ally themselves with Israel than with Iran, okay? And yet his policies seem to treat the whole region as one region and totally ignoring the various tensions, the ethnic tensions, the religious tensions that exist within the region, okay? So that, that of course, uh, so much of what Obama did left the Mideast literally in shambles, okay? And one of the things we did see under Trump was that Trump, or at least Trump's advisors, had a much better understanding of the, the various, um, uh, the different, you know, issues that are in the Middle East, who the different countries are, where the different alliances can be made. And he actually reached out to, forgot Iran, he immediately rescinded the treaty with Iran, said, no, Iran and Saudi Arabia can't sit in the same room. It's not just that Iran and Israel can't sit in the same room. Iran is a danger, get rid of them. And then created relationships with, with Saudi Arabia and with the United Arab Emirates and all these, in addition to having much better relationships, of course, with Israel. The one, the one plus in this whole thing, the one thing that might uh, prevent or slow Biden from achieving what he wants with Iran is the Gulf states. Because if it's just Israel, everyone's gonna say, oh, Israel, of course, they hate the Muslims, they hate the Arabs, which is not true, but okay. You know, they don't have human rights, they don't care about anybody, they're racist, you know, you get all those comments all over the place. Um, that's, that's very, you know, that does, there's a lot of people out there that if Israel stands up against Iran, there's a lot of people say, so what? But if Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates join with Israel in uh, trying to stop Biden from reaching out to Iran, well, that's a whole different ballgame. Because then you cannot say that, um, uh, you know, rescinding the treaty with Iran was an anti-Muslim thing. Uh -uh -uh -uh. You have these very Muslim countries together with the one Jewish state standing together shoulder to shoulder and saying, Iran is dangerous. This therefore may be, in other words, that's just a maybe, because I know Biden doesn't want to think like this right now. Uh, this may well be, you know, one way that we can at least stop what Biden wants to do with Iran. Now, one of the things, of course, that has been... Um, unfortunate I, about, well, let me just address the Abraham Accords uh, one more thing. Uh, the extent to which this is real normalization. I think it really is. We are seeing in Israel, first of all, Israeli businesses have already doing, are already doing deals with these countries. People have gone there, they've come back, they've reported unbelievably warm relationships. They are, this is one of the things I, there was a, um, a whole series of articles like two weeks ago of a number of Orthodox Jewish uh, reporters and tourism representatives that went to uh, Abu Dhabi uh, and to Dubai and discovered, number one, that the government now has made it a law that every single hotel in the United Arab Emirates has to accommodate strictly kosher food for anyone who wants it. I mean, this is amazing. The, the, not no other country in the world, not Europe, not the United States, nobody, nobody. It's by law saying, if an Orthodox Jew or a Jew comes and wants to keep kosher, you will tell you've got to accommodate them. This is just, this is amazing. They have so many things that they are setting up. They, they a synagogue and, and, and beaches. This is also very interesting. You know, Muslims are very modest in, in how they, you know, dress and, and um, I mean, we have different rules, but very similar in that sense. And um, Muslim men and women will not go to the beach together. There'll be separate beaches, okay? Well, Orthodox Jewish men and women also don't go to the beach together. So if I'm looking for a place to holiday, you know, if I go to the United Arab Emirates, not only will I get kosher food, but I'm going to be able to go to the beach. 
Just like I can, in Israel, we have separate beaches, not for everybody, but it's an option. So it's really, it's, it's kind of mind boggling when we think about this, this is a really warm piece, at least the way we're seeing it right now. Uh, and that's really very special. When I first heard about the Abraham Accords, I was very hesitant about it because I, I was very skeptical. And today I'm seeing a face of it that is giving me a lot more optimism. One of the things though that was disturbing to us was the need that, that what Trump did and what uh, Israel had to agree to was that the issue of sovereignty was going to be removed from the table for now. Now, one of the things I have to uh, uh, emphasize this was not written in the accords. There is nothing in the accords at all that talks about the Palestinians or dividing up Israel or boundaries of Israel. That's one of the things that's so beautiful. The accords are only about business and peaceful relations between the United Emirates and Israel. It has nothing to do with the Palestinians, it has nothing to do with boundaries, and that is very, very good. And, and, and the economic ties between the two countries are seen as equal. We have something to give them, they have something to give us. It is an equal uh, type of business relationship, which is also has a lot of respect, okay? However, there was this oral understanding that at least for now, and I think the, the, uh, the importance of this was that the, the United Arab Emirates understood that in going forward with this agreement, they were gonna be stirring a lot of hostility within the general Arab world. And indeed, the Palestinians are furious because what these, what these agreements basically did was say the Palestinians are irrelevant to Middle East peace. Here, Israel's having peace with all these very powerful Arab nations, and it makes no difference what the Palestinians are doing or saying. So in, in, a, in a sense, this has been an enormous accomplishment, okay? Now, the issue of extending sovereignty, it was an oral understanding to delay it. Could have been for a few weeks, a few months, and never was it written. It was just an understanding. Now, if President Trump would continue to become president, I am fairly confident that within a few months, things you know, are stabilized, uh, real relationships, visas, all the stuff that still has to be worked out, the technicalities of that, would be settled between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and maybe even Saudi Arabia. Then we would be able to go ahead with sovereignty, or at least some element of sovereignty, um, uh, you know, because there was nothing against it in the agreement. Biden becomes president, that's a whole different story. Because there's no question, if Israel goes forward with any element of extending sovereignty, the United States will not recognize it, okay? And it doesn't pay for us to extend sovereignty if we're not gonna have at least one major country recognizing it, otherwise it doesn't make sense. However, there are a lot of other things we can do. And sovereignty is a legal issue but extending our communities, um, treating our communities as if we had extended sovereignty and changing the way things are done here, that can be done without extending sovereignty. That would not require you know, someone else to recognize it. Now the question then becomes, and this is really a question for Israel and a question that none of us really know because right now our own government is a mess, okay? I have a feeling we're gonna be going to elections sometime in the next six months and the cards will be reshuffled and we don't know what our government will look like. But I just have to, and with this, I will just close this portion and open it to questions and answers. First of all, I hope that if Biden takes over or, and this may be a worst case scenario, if Biden is not able to fulfill his uh, entire term and Kamala Harris takes over, she's certainly not a friend of Israel. Um, we can be in for some tough times. However, I am hoping that with the foundations that have been laid with the relationships with the Gulf states, and if our own government has the fortitude and the confidence to just say, look, you know, this is what it is. We have to do what's good for us. We invite you to come along with us, the United States, but if not, you know, we're gonna still do it. I'm hoping that that is something that we will be able to, to see moving forward. Okay, now, um, I would like to end though with one little piece of, of optimism, okay? Just remember, we started this talk talking about from Abraham to the Abraham Accords, okay? Now, let's remember what Abraham was all about. 
That was God's promise. We know God's promise will be fulfilled. And it is our responsibility to do whatever we can to move that promise forward. But if there are obstacles in our way, they're just obstacles. Doesn't matter if it's Biden or if it's Kamala Harris or whoever it may be. They're not gonna stop what is already a process that has been moving forward for decades. We will find a way. We may not be able to move forward as quickly as we liked, but we will continue to move forward. We will find a way. And this, by the way, is where you come in. You, as Christian supporters of uh, our work of Judea and Samaria, you are able to stand with us. You can raise your voices in your own countries. You can provide financial support for actual things we are doing to strengthen the communities and to expand them. By working together, you and I, as ordinary people, we have an alternative avenue to ensuring that this prophecy will be fulfilled regardless of who and what the political leaders are doing. Um, so I'd like to open this up now to um, questions and answers. Uh, we're not gonna do this in any uh, formal way. I think the best thing is if you have a question, press your space bar and just ask it and then release it when you've finished your question. Sandra, what do you think about um, Blinken as the new Secretary of State? He's a Jewish guy. I don't know very much about him. I read something yesterday. Um, from what I understand, though, that he is definitely, you know, part of the Biden-Trump, um, you know, way of looking at the Middle East, two-state solution and all that. Um, I don't know. In, in other words, at the end of the day, this is, um, Biden is not going to be Trump. He just isn't, okay? Uh, and so the question is, and I'll tell you the truth, one of the things that I would like to see happen is if, and we saw this, by the way, I meant to mention this and I didn't, uh, um, the Secretary, current Secretary of State, Pompeo, was just in Israel and made some two amazing statements. One, he talked about BDS as being anti-Semitism and endorsed the idea of legislating in that direction. And secondly, he talked about um, labeling that, and he said, this is something that will be right now already American law, that any produce um, made uh, in the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, any, any things that are created in places that are in Area C, where Israel has complete jurisdiction, those things will be labeled as made in Israel. Now that is, is an amazing thing, and I would like to hope that there are other countries that follow suit. But if indeed that is passed into legislation and becomes final, it's the kind of thing that might be difficult for Biden to reverse. I think he could, it's not like a treaty. Uh, you, can't re you can't change a treaty, uh, but I mean, you can break it, but nobody's gonna wanna do that. Uh, but even so, something like this would be harder for uh, Biden to reverse. I would like to see more things happening. In fact, I was hoping, I don't know that anybody's talking about this today, but I was hoping that even Israel would be able to reach an agreement with Trump to extend sovereignty over some part of Judea and Samaria, which would be recognized before January 20th. Because again, that's the kind of thing, if the United States recognizes the sovereignty or the territorial borders of a particular country under one president, the next president can't change that. It's, it's just something that you won't do. You can't do that. So it becomes a little complicated because as I just talked about, people do not want to jeopardize the relationship with the Gulf states at this particular point when Biden's about to take over and we may need the Gulf states to help prevent the Iran deals. Um, so it is very, very complicated, but this is the kind of direction that I'm hoping for just in these next few weeks. We'll see. Anyone else? Uh, Steve Franklin, I see you're speaking, but I don't hear you. Press your space bar or unmute yourself. Yes, okay. If U.S. would back away from the sovereignty movement, but then the, uh, say the UAE would weigh more heavily in favor of it, 
how would that change the balance as far as Israel is concerned? Okay, I don't think that the UAE will ever come out in favor of Israel extending sovereignty. Never. Uh, because they still have to be seen as, you know, part of this Arab uh, whatever. The most we can hope for from the UAE is they're not going to make a fuss. Now, they may make a little fuss, okay? But that they're not going to make a fuss in any way that, that significantly changes the relationships that we have now built, okay? So um, I think what was going on until now was that there was a there was a shift in balance One, and it's very possible by the way that the trump plan of the century became a, a a catalyzer for the gulf states to decide well we better sign an agreement with israel now otherwise it's going to be more difficult for us to sell this to our people if we're coming in right on the hills of sovereignty and and of course that it, it could be that that played a role um but what we have seen most definitely is that there's no question the Gulf states could care less about the Palestinians. And the Palestinians actually earned that attitude from their own actions and the way that they have, cons and they, some of the Arab leaders are saying this, you know, every opportunity that they had to make peace and to, to receive land, uh, they rejected. So at some point, the rest of the Arab world is saying, well, who needs you? They don't need you. You know, they, they're a very, they're a seriously destabilizing influence in the Middle East. And I may add one more point that I didn't, that I didn't have a chance to mention earlier, but I think it's critical. Uh, more and more of the Arabs who are living here, the Palestinian Arabs who are living here in Judea and Samaria, more and more of them do not want a Palestinian state. Not because they don't have these, they don't think they, they deserve one. They think because there's no question that the leadership of the Palestinians are corrupt, and that's all that it will ever be. A Palestinian state will not be good, good for the Palestinian people. And this the Palestinian people are saying, okay? So when they look at what their choices are, more and more of them are saying, we would rather be under the state of Israel than under a Palestinian state. Because as individuals, we will do better. We will have freedom. We will have education. We will have economic uh, opportunities, which the Palestinian Authority has gone out of its way to quash at every opportunity. And so these are situations that sometimes things are better left unsaid. But if you know that that is, you know, what's going on, what, what the background is, then things can move forward, even if they're only moving forward in an unofficial way. So what I see in, in, with regard to Biden is Biden could very possibly, may probably, obstruct what could be positive movement because he's going to, again, go with this two-state solution that nobody thinks is a good idea. Not really. Uh, Sandra, may I ask a question? Uh, sure. You focused very nicely on the uh, Gulf states, and I appreciate that. Uh, you didn't talk about the dynamics that might affect uh, President Biden, and he definitely will be the president. President Biden's uh, actions in uh, looking at the alignment of Russia, Turkey, and Syria with Iran. Uh, that's something that we're watching with great interest because of Ezekiel 38. But uh, that's a, you know, that's a reality on the on the ground. Uh, what do you think about that? Okay, so first of all, um, Turkey, Iran, and Syria are very much a a crescent, you know, that is very dangerous uh, to Israel and to the Western world, and. Um, I, I think that, again, everything having to do with the Iran and its access, the Gulf states will be very helpful, I think, in pressuring uh, Biden um, uh, to, to, to not go as far as he wants to go. I don't know if we'll succeed, okay? Uh, but there are pressure points. And don't forget, when it comes to an agreement, Biden, uh, not, excuse me, Obama barely had that agreement passed in Congress. And I'm hoping that the Senate uh, remains in the hands of the Republicans. Uh, and on the Democratic side, uh, there are Democrats who are against the agreement with, with Iran as well. So there is, even within American politics, there is a chance that we would not be, that, that Biden would not succeed in you know, having an agreement with Iran. Um, but when it comes to Russia, that's a whole different ballgame. Because Russia, Russia is different. Russia is, um, 
Very often, American politics has based itself on determining whether a particular country is with us or against us. With Russia, it doesn't work like that. It may work like that with the United States, by the way. It doesn't work like that with Israel. Russia, on the one hand, has been the most important supplier to Syria of arms, arms that are used against Israel. And yet, Netanyahu has created a relationship with Russia that has enabled us, basically gives us freedom to go against Syria anytime we think that Syria is operating against us, which is a very unusual situation. Can you say Israel and Russia are good friends? No, because Russia is arming our biggest enemies. And yet Israel has reached an arrangement with Russia. Why are we able to bomb bases in the heart of Syria? Russia controls these areas and they don't do anything. Why? Because we have reached an arrangement. We are going to bomb Syria whenever they are threatening Israel. And it works. So Russia is a much more complicated thing. Russia has to be dealt with like uh, doing business deals. You know, you make a deal on this issue, you make a deal on that issue. You don't talk about friendships and, and allies. You just do deals. And I am confident that a Democratic president, and certainly Biden, won't have a clue on how to do that, quick, unfortunately. Quick question. Quick question. So in review, it would appear that the one concern is military and, and, and military safety on one side. The other concern that may drive this process is the prospect of economic development. Is that true? Well, I think you have both sides. I think, I think economic development is good for everybody. Uh, and military, you know, it depends who we were talking about. You know, the fact that if the Gulf states indeed are not part of a uh, of supporting uh, terrorism or war against Israel, we've already neutralized what could have been another uh, strategic threat. Uh, if we can't, we are together with the Gulf states against Iran, that's a good thing. Um, what's important to us, though, is that America, now one of the things I have to say good about Obama he did sign an agreement with Israel that was a long-term agreement uh, that upped our, the level of security cooperation and security support for Israel of the United States more than ever been. And that is a positive thing that Obama did. Uh, so we do have that with America and I don't see Biden changing that. Um, Israel has to look out for its interests in every single relationship in every single circumstance has to be individually evaluated and determine how to proceed. Do I have any other questions? Anybody else interested in asking a question? Okay. I'll just say, Sandra, do you think that Trump still has time to push for sovereignty at this late stage? Well, th there's a few things. First of all, he can't push for sovereignty. The most that America can do is recognize something that Israel does. So the question is, first of all, can he, one of the things that was problematic in the delays until now was that there was this committee that was established between the Americans and the Israelis of determining uh, how to draw the lines what would be, uh, where sovereignty would apply and where it wouldn't be. And this is where things got bogged down. Now, what he can do is he can, they can decide to, either he can say, well, you know, we'll give in more to Israel. Or he can say, well, there's certain places that we've all agreed on, so let's at least start a partial application of sovereignty. Uh, and then Israel has to decide that they want to do that, and then America recognizes it. So it really is a give and take between Israel and the United States. It's not a question of time. This is something, if, if, if there's a map in place, or a map that could be created quickly, if it's brought before the government of Israel, it can be passed in a day. If it's brought before the Knesset, it'll be passed in a day, okay? And then it's done. So if, if uh, Israel if Israel gets the green light from America, and then the next day, uh, Trump uh, recognizes it, it's done. A president has full power until the day he leaves office. Really? He can do anything within his purview. I mean, and the, conduct, the conduct, conduct of foreign relations is 100% 
in the purview of a president of the United States. So it can be done in time. Question is, will it be done? And that I don't know. One more question, Sandra. So on the broad political horizon, we have the issue of sovereignty. But on the small scale, and I'm trying to understand your perspective, there's still the possibility of the settlement movement continuing somewhat in the background. Well, what, no one has ever stopped us. That I need to make it very clear. Okay, what has happened is that o over the years, there have been times when the Israeli government has refused to give, um, just to give a little background here, uh, all building in Judea and Samaria in the communities, uh, whereas in all the rest of Israel, building <clears throat> permits are given by a municipality and they're the only ones who have control. Once the land is part of the municipality's arena, you know, region, then, then it's only up to the mayor and his city council or whatever to, to approve the building. In the case of Judea and Samaria, nothing can be done without the uh, approval of the prime minister. Uh, and it's not just the prime minister, it goes to a lot of different bureaucratic and political channels. It's, it's a very long drawn out process, very politically charged. Until now, the limitations on building in Judea and Samaria have been because prime ministers and Netanyahu included, will call a halt to, to settlement building or to new expansions, okay? And that puts a, holds us back. Um, there's another issue uh, because there were that periods of time where there was no construction or no expansion. You could construct within the current boundaries of a community, but if you wanted to build on that hill across there, a hill that the land belonged to the, to the public, it was government land, it wasn't uh, land belonging to a Palestinian, we're not, we're not you know, taking land away from somebody. But if you wanted to build on that hill, for years already, the policy of the Israeli government had been, we are not expanding communities, we are not going on to the next hill, and that is as a result of a commitment that was made by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to President George W. Bush. And that was at George W. Bush's insistence, okay? No expansion of the communities itself. And so as a result, over the years, there were activists who said, this is crazy. We are gonna find ourselves closed in into very small ghettos. We have to expand. And so a number of communities were established on many hilltops adjacent to nearby communities in most cases. And those communities were often treated with a sort of mixed attitude on the part of the Israeli government. The Israeli government would all be, would very often provide uh, military uh, protection. They would uh, 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 build the roads going to that community. They would provide electricity. In other words, there was a lot of unofficial cooperation on the part of the Israeli government with these communities, but the communities remained officially illegal, which also created all different kinds of issues uh, the people building houses in those communities did not have a legal um, building permit. And therefore, really, at any point, somebody could go, you know, a government could say, no, you're not legal and, and tear down the house. So this has been a situation that for years already, Netanyahu has promised, I am going to legalize these hilltops. Now, just to be clear, the only thing that he needs to do to legalize the hilltops is sign a piece of paper. It's not like he's got to go buy somebody's land or, or do something. In other words, he's got to create a certain type of legislation. He's got to sign some paper and it's it. He's been promising this for years and he hasn't done it. And so this is the type of thing that, that we said, well, what is going on here? Netanyahu will say he's a big fan of the, 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 the communities, etc. Now, one of the advantages of sovereignty would be that the process would go back to the mayors, like in the rest of Israel. You wouldn't need the prime minister's signature. So, but short of sovereignty, if the prime minister will sign the, 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 the papers and allow us to expand these communities and, and open the doors, we can have enormous expansion, not by just by uh, building more houses in an existing community, but expanding to the next hills. And that would create those facts on the ground that we were talking about. Mm. So we'll have sovereignty in another couple of years. But if we could have effective sovereignty by expanding these communities, that would be wonderful. But it requires the government of Israel to actually do what it says it's gonna do. And that's been one of our biggest challenges. Okay. Uh, Sandra, I'd like to ask another question about Saudi Arabia. Uh, Right now, Joe Biden has made some very uh, cold remarks to Saudi Arabia, 
and he's he's definitely going to be setting a different uh, tone for U.S. policy with regard to Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, Saudi Arabia seems, uh, at least to an outside observer, overdue for a revolution, which might not put a more favorable government in place in the short term. Long term, the Lord's going to work it out. But um, what what's your take on where things might go with Saudi Arabia now with the change of administration? Look, Saudi Arabia has never paid attention to anybody else says. Uh, if anything, though, in the last year, we are seeing more liberal steps within Saudi Arabia. As I mentioned earlier, they've opened themselves up to tourism. They have women can now drive. Uh, there's certain relaxation of a code of dress. Uh, women don't have to cover their face anymore. Uh, these are what, you know, for, for us, it seems silly, but for Saudi Arabia, these are major reforms. It doesn't mean Saudi Arabia is a democracy, but, but most countries are not democracies, you know? So there's definitely problems with Saudi Arabia, and there's, you know, people that are being uh, held in prison that shouldn't be, and, you know, political uh, uh, protesters, etc. But the reason Saudi Arabia remains in power is because it does very well by its citizens. It is a wealthy country. Now, it's not as wealthy as it used to be because many of other countries now are um, oil independent and don't need Saudi Arabia as much as it used to. But Saudi Arabia still has a lot of money and Saudi Arabia looks after its citizens. It, not as, again, the, the, the citizens of the United Arab Emirates are, are in a better shape than the citizens of Saudi Arabia, but the citizens of Saudi Arabia have healthcare, they have education, uh, they have jobs, you know? so. I don't see why anybody would want to to uh, revolt. It, look, there's a country that is ready for revolt is Iran, because the people of Iran have a miserable existence. Their economy is absolutely terrible. Uh, there's no economic opportunity. It's a very crowded country uh, with a lot of potential. The people of Iran have always been talented, educated, etc. And um, the government is really just just, you know, put all those people in a hole. Uh, but Iran, of course, is a very powerful um, powerful uh, apparatus there that's going to make a revolution very difficult. But, you know, who would have ever anticipated that the Iron Curtain would fall and it fell? So sometimes you just have to feel like we can't anticipate and we just have to sit back and watch what God is doing because he, he's had it all figured out, just we haven't figured it all out yet. It's much easier for us to analyze the past than to predict the future. Anyway, any, anyone else before we close today? I would like to make a comment. This is Valerie Please. in Lakewood, Colorado. Um, hi, Valerie. Hi. <laughs> uh, I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. It is an observant Jewish radio station uh, in Israel that's very connected to... Um, <clears throat> to uh, countries all over the world and specifically America. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And um, they enter, it's mostly, like I said, it's, it's run by observant Jews. So it's, it, it's very- What's the name of the station? Israel News Talk Radio. Have you heard of Tamar Yona? Yes, of course. Okay, great, she's the manager. Okay. And so she and uh, they have interviewed uh, a, a few rabbis and the rabbis they believe that donald trump is he, here by by assignment from god from hashem and that he has got to win this you know the, the electoral college you know we can't say biden's gonna be the next president that's a curse the uh, the the electoral college has not rallied up the votes and they found all kinds of illegalities and, and all kinds of bad things but they believe, uh, these rabbis believe that Donald Trump has got to finish the job. And they believe that he is going to pave the way for Mashiach, which I think is, oh, I hope they're right. I really hope they're right. So I just suggest that y'all listen to, you know, Israel News Talk Radio in light of, you know, all the positive things they have. They have teachings, they have rabbi classes, they, they talk about the history of Israel. They, they inform us Americans of what's really going on spiritually and from, from the Torah. And it's, it's, it's awesome. So I just wanted to, um, you know, put a shout out for there. And okay. We, well, let me, you know, I am certainly not getting involved in what's going on in the American political scene today. 
what I can say is I don't know the, any, uh, you know, I don't know who those rabbis are, but I don't know of rabbis who are serious figures here in Israel who are making any predictions of this kind. Uh, it is very clear in Judaism uh, that we don't know who Messiah is or when he's going to come. Uh, we know that there are processes going. We believe we're in that path. We believe that with the redemption of Israel, the restoration of Israel, we are definitely in that path. When it will happen, how it will happen, I suggest that we all just sit back a little bit and, and, and wait and see, because we, we just don't know. And I think when you have rabbis or anybody saying, oh, I know this is going to happen and this is what it is, and then, you know what? Like, I, I just think we need to be a little skeptical because when people come across with that kind of confidence, you've got to wonder, you know, where, where it is that, that that's coming from. And, and the Bible gives us very clear direction, but the direction is on the trend and on the direction. I don't think it's, it will happen on the, the, you know, 25th of December at six o'clock in the evening and it'll be this person. You know, let's, let's wait and see. I, I personally am disappointed if Trump uh, will not continue, but it looks to me that that's what will happen. I mean, there are legal things going on and, you know, whatever it is, is. What I do hope that for the sake of America, for the sake of all the other countries, I hope that whatever does happen, that the nation accepts the results and we don't see civil war because civil war would be a disaster for everybody. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Well, on, the, on Sandra, those words, Sandra, yes. yes. I, I just want to say two things. One, in Ezekiel, um, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 30, 14, that all her lovers will leave her. In the United States as a lover, we know in the time of Jacob's trouble, all her lovers will leave her. Why? Because only God is going to save her and keep her and give her the land that he promised to Abraham. And that land is Genesis 15, 18 from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And how far does the Euphrates go? Well, it goes to the Gulf Coast. So the Lord is going to take care of Israel, no matter what the nations say. So have faith. The West, the West Bank or the East Bank, <laughs> Judea and Samaria, that is the land of Israel. But even these other countries are the land promised by God. Well said. And I just want to, I think this is, a, let's, let's end this on a positive note. And I really and truly believe we have been through problematic leaders in Israel. We have been through problematic leaders in the United States. We have been through terrible actions of the United Nations. Uh, and we are still here. We're not going anywhere. And I want you to keep that in mind. I truly believe that whatever happens, Judea and Samaria will remain in Israel's hands. We may have more challenges than we have today. It may take longer to accomplish the next step, but we are not going anywhere. And I want to just encourage all of you to stand with us and to do whatever you can to help us, whether it is donating to help the communities with very real needs. It doesn't matter what the politicians say. It matters what we do here on the ground. And if you can join with us and partner with us on the ground, believe me, that's what it matters. And I also believe that when God is looking down and deciding when and how to intervene, he's going to do that based on what he sees we are doing. And if we are moving forward and doing what's right, he will partner with us and help us bring us the blessing and help us reach success. Anyway, it's been wonderful to talk to all of you today. I would look forward to being in touch with you by email. Feel free to send an email or, or any further questions. We'll talk again soon. Have a great day. Thank you, Sandra. Sandra, Man, thank you, thank Sandra. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. And, and thanks for the like Paul, and uh, thank you, Jennifer. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks from Canada, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, from New York. Thanks from the UK. I'm from UK. Thanks from Michigan, USA. Yay. Thanks from Stafford, UK. Yes, from Colorado. Thanks, for, thanks from Canada as well. <laughs> Hi, Pat. Hi, hello. <laughs> nice to hear you again. <laughs>